Hi everyone, welcome back. Dr. Angela here with you. Dr. Patty, hi. Hi, so in this video, we're gonna focus on Hashimoto's, Hashimoto's thyroid disease. So some of you have been asking, what's the difference between hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's? So we're doing a little video to explain. Hashimoto's is typically hypothyroidism, but it's autoimmune, and so that's the big difference. Um, you can have Hashimoto's and not be hypothyroid, so what that would mean is to test positive for antibodies against your thyroid, but to still have normal thyroid hormone levels. Typically, if Hashimoto's goes on for a prolonged period of time, ultimately the thyroid gland does fail because the immune system is attacking our thyroid glands, so our own immune system start to attack our thyroid gland. And over time, our thyroid becomes less and less functional and is less able to put out thyroid hormone. But in the beginning, people are often not hypothyroid, but um, so some- So just to clarify, yeah. like, you can have hypothyroid yes. where your thyroid function is a little sluggish and yes. it's not working very well, but you're not attacking your own Correct. thyroid tissue or gland. Whereas yeah. Hashimoto's, when Dr. Angela says it's autoimmune, it means that your body, not only may you have low thyroid function, yes. but your body's also attacking the thyroid. Yeah, specifically our immune system is attacking our thyroid. And so the thing to say about all autoimmune conditions is typically they're multifactorial. It could be a situation where you just have one reason why your immune system has activated and has attacked your thyroid gland, but more often than not, there's a multifactorial situation. Rarely is life that simple. Right, I hate I to tell you, but usually. <laughs> I know the one sweet factor, so it makes the workup a little bit tricky, but the reason we're focusing on this is that, you know, Typically in our culture, in our medical system, when we treat Hashimoto's, we kind of treat it like every other hypothyroid situation where we just replace thyroid hormone and it's not in our best interest. And the reason it's not in our best interest is that if we allow the autoimmune piece to go on unaddressed, which is typically what happens, then we're really at risk for having um, immune system confusion continue and have some other tissue in our body be affected. So, and many people who have autoimmune conditions often have two or three absolutely. other autoimmune conditions. So you may have lupus yeah. and Hashimoto's yeah. or rheumatoid arthritis because yeah. that deeper cause of the immune system confusion, as Dr. Angela mentioned, is not actually being addressed. Yeah, it's. I mean, we really have kind of a triage approach of just stabilize whatever's happening in that local system without looking at how everything is connected. And so, you know, this is the question of like, why do we get autoimmune conditions to begin with? And it's complicated. Um, definitely, there's often a genetic predisposition, not always, but there often is. So that's one of the things to look at in your family history. Um, is there the same, does somebody else have Hashimoto's or are there other types of like we were saying lupus or Crohn's or something else that there's an autoimmune component to. Um, looking at our sex hormones, that's a pretty big um, reason where something can get tipped off. Like for example, maybe a woman is pregnant and then she gives birth and like right after that, like thyroid gets really wacky. There's a really big hormone transition up and down with pregnancy or a different phase of life. And that can be a time when we see um, auto antibodies rise up. Mm -hmm. So there's a clue that sex hormones play a piece. Specifically, estrogen seems to be a trigger for many autoimmune issues. So looking at those things. Um, GI microflora, so we talk a lot about what kinds of gut bugs we have. Um, so if we have too many pathogenic bacteria, not enough of our good bacteria, that can be something that turns the switch on for some of us. Um, and we did just do a video on leaky gut. Yeah. So there is a connection between leaky gut and autoimmune disease, Absolutely. so check out that video to get a little bit more information about that. Absolutely. And so there's the piece of the types of bugs that we have, and then there's also um, if we're having a pro-inflammatory diet, that could be contributing to leaky gut. If we're having foods that we're allergic to or um, we have an intolerance to, so one clue, if you as a young person had a bunch of eczema, that's probably a sign that you have a bunch of food allergies or intolerances. Some people grow 
out of that, but that you know could be something to pay attention to if, as a young person, something set off asthma or eczema for you. Um, and then another thing is environmental toxicity. So people who work in farm areas where there's a lot of herbicides or pesticides, or if we have an environmental change, maybe we move into an apartment with mold or something like that, that can definitely um, trip our immune system. Getting sick, um, high viral load of some kind, that can be an on-off switch or some kind of a stressor. Um, I've definitely seen in practice over the years if somebody loses a family member abruptly, somebody's killed in a car accident, you know, something deeply traumatizing, that can set off a shift in the immune system that wasn't there previously. And so the reason we pay attention to what are these triggers is like we always talk about whenever we're trying to treat something, the reasons why we have a certain condition could be different from why another person has that condition. So it always makes sense to figure out what the underlying cause is. If we can, it's not always easy to do that investigative work, but if we can figure that out, you know, starting there for treatment is always what makes sense. And if I could be so bold as to add a little more of a what I call hippy dippy side of this medicine. <laughs> like kind of going back to the stress factor, you mm -hmm. know, when there's an autoimmune component, even asking yourself on a deeper level, mm -hmm. maybe journaling about it, why might I be attacking myself? Or um, you know, sort of in a more um, on a more mental, emotional, mind-body connection. So not just stress at work and stress with family, things like that, but really maybe internal stress. Um, and so looking at that piece as well and um, working that out. Yeah. Another thing to just kind of globally check in with ourselves about is what changed? Like if there was a major lifestyle change in the year before to just kind of think about, all right, I got sick, what happened leading up to this that might be something that helps us localize pinpoint what the trigger or triggers were so we just have an idea of where to start to work things up so and before we dive into yeah. treatment because i think that's where that's you're where headed, i'm going <laughs> i just dr angela touched on it but only because this is something that most of my patients don't know and a lot of you may not know yeah. um, as far as labs i think it's important to reiterate asking your primary care doctor your internist your naturopathic doctor whoever's your running your, your yep. endocrinologist just whoever's running your labs to make sure they are running um, anti-TPO and thyroid peroxidase antibodies mm -hmm. and thyroglobulin antibodies. So those are yeah. the two main ones that you want to look for um, that will tell you if your body is more in, is just hypothyroid or in a Hashimoto's state. So often labs will just be TSH. Yes. Or you know if you're lucky, you'll have a doctor who runs your T4 and your T3, and that would be free T4 and free T3. Mm -hmm. But really running these antibodies as well. So when I have patients with fatigue and that's one of the more common symptoms yep. um, you know or weight gain mm -hmm. and I'm running uh, blood work mm -hmm. I will and we're doing a thyroid panel I will make sure to add the antibodies to see okay are you are you possibly hypothyroid if if yes are you are you Hashimoto's is exactly. there an autoimmune piece so make sure that you advocate for yourself and do the research and you know watch our videos this is I guess part of your research <laughs> um, and ask your doctor to run those because sometimes you do really have to let them know um, that you want a little bit more extensive testing yeah and the reason again that we're wanting to figure out if it's Hashimoto's versus just regular hypothyroid is if it is Hashimoto's we want to address the autoimmune piece because standard of care for all hypothyroid in our conventional medical society is to just do thyroid replacement most of the time. Like if our thyroid hormone is low, we give thyroid hormone, which in and of itself is a good thing to do so that we have healthy thyroid levels, but if we don't address the autoimmune piece, we might end up attacking some other tissue in our bodies. We really want to stop the attack, the personal attack. So in terms of the treatment now, where to start? Well, um, if we can pinpoint what the triggers were, those would be really good starting points. So, you know, thinking about the genetics, now we have all these really wonderful tools. There's the 23andMe kits or the Ancestry kits, you know, on the market that you can buy. And then you can run that raw data into other databases like NutraHacker.com or Stratagene. You know, there's several on the market. And you can look at um, pathway by pathway for each of your chromosomes um, if there's something called the SNP or a variant. And um, 
there those different programs will show you like which amino acids which things correct or help to support those pathways that might be part of the reason why um, you're prone to this um, genetic issue so that's one um, if sex hormones are off like again for a woman and maybe she you know just had a child maybe for a man he's gained a bunch of weight all of a sudden his estrogen testosterone levels are you know off so if we can figure that out and work on the sex hormone imbalance, that can be one of the ways that we um, fix this. And so um, we can work on foods that help with you know, hormone balance. A lot of our other videos talk about that. We can work on liver detox that you know, supports that, but looking at the area of like what the cause is and then you know, addressing that pathway. Um, if it's due to um, a gut infection or microbial overgrowth issue, you know, the different types of stool tests or SIBO tests, figuring out what those things are and then treating those gut bugs and then adding in, you know, probiotics to restore the normal flora. So moral of the story yeah. being don't just look at the thyroid. Yeah, don't absolutely. just turn off the smoke detector. You want to use that as a guide to keep going into where is this ultimately coming from. So as Dr. Angela is saying, it can be from chronic inflammation, chronic yeah. infection, hormone imbalance. So yeah. um, you know, going a little bit deeper and treating all of you yes. as a whole individual. Yes. And so anyone with an autoimmune disease is going to benefit from an anti-inflammatory diet. More specifically, if you can also figure out if you have have food allergens or intolerances addressing those um, assume that you have leaky gut if you have an autoimmune issues you might not but it doesn't hurt to treat yourself as if you've got leaky gut for a few months and really focus on healing up the gut lining we just did a video for you guys on leaky gut so there's some really good pointers in there on how to heal up the gut but just in general thinking about things that kind of calm down inflammation in the system. And so, you know, those were things like the essential fatty acids, the probiotics, vitamin D, vitamin A, lots of good tools. Um, you can look at the description box here at the other video as well. We'll put that all in there for you, but calming down the immune system. Um, or Modulating and balancing the autoimmune piece. And exactly. Then as far as addressing um, the thyroid hormone levels, mm -hmm. some nutrients um, that you might want to consider are um, uh, vitamin, uh, I mean selenium, mm -hmm. uh, zinc mm -hmm. is another one, yep. um, iodine mm -hmm. we talk about a lot and there's a lot of um, information out there about iodine so just be cautious right about yep. um, not taking too high of a dose and making yep. and actually that there's a difference between iodide and iodine mm -hmm. um, so getting the right levels of iodine um, chromium. and foods looking at mm -hmm. foods that are rich in these nutrients yes chromium, mm -hmm. chromium. definitely mm -hmm. and that supports the adrenals as well which mm -hmm. often adrenal function and thyroid function go hand in hand speaking of that you know before we continue on with the nutrients you know um, there's all a lot of our systems are all intertwined yeah. you know it's not they're just not all separated out and the adrenals and the thyroid as dr angela um said at one point to me i thought oh what a great way of putting it they're they're um very much considered to be married mm -hmm. and actually thyroid adrenals and ovaries or sex hormones are also sort of a little family and that's mm -hmm. why often there's dysfunction in all those areas and i find in my practice that and i think dr angela would agree that by the time someone starts to have thyroid issues it probably symptoms means, in other words that you're really seeing it that they're coming into your mm -hmm, office mm -hmm. it probably means that you've had adrenal um, dysfunction or your adrenals have been stressed for a long time and they've now started to recruit maybe the sex hormones the thyroid to try to bring balance the body's always yeah. going to try to work to bring balance yeah um, we have smart so, bodies yeah but sometimes we push them a little too far yeah. um, so just continuing on with nutrients um, mm -hmm. we mentioned chromium copper is another one tyrosine is another one too so the mm -hmm. amino acid um, that's a precursor for thyroid hormones so making sure like everything's replete anything that would be normally helping your thyroid gland to make healthy levels like i mean we can certainly do thyroid hormone replacement but just making sure that we're not low in iron you know mm -hmm. the basics for putting out good thyroid and hormone we'll levels. list these all in the description box and um, maybe if there's any combination formulas that we like um, because you're not going to necessarily do 
a bottle of iron, a bottle of copper, a bottle of zinc. You know, you yeah. might. Sometimes I do prescribe that way, but so we'll list some of our favorites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, if we get to the place where we're going to be doing some thyroid hormone replacement because the thyroid gland is no longer capable of putting out that much thyroid hormone, just being on a really wonderful high potency multivitamin is a really good starting place for repleting. Um, and then, you know, in addition to the actual thyroid hormones. So, um, you know, you'll... I don't use a lot of multivitamins yeah. in my practice, to be honest. Um, you know, we're all different in the way that we practice. Yeah. Um, but I think that it can be helpful. I would just say be mindful of um, making sure that your multivitamin is good in terms of it's really cleanliness important. as well as dosing yeah. sometimes you just get such little and amounts active forms active yeah forms. sometimes you just get such no, little amounts of potency. a lot of things yeah, definitely. so you're taking you we're know, not talking centrum no you know, like no. we're not talking like drugstore level and definitely even good quality sometimes you get good quality but you don't get a lot of stuff in there yeah um, so high potency you know and just think logically you can only cram so much into one pill whether it's you know um, something from the drugstore or even something that's good quality. Usually if you want to get a lot, there's going to be at least a couple pills that you're mm -hmm, going to need to mm -hmm. take. Very true. Um, so in addition to the nutrients that we mentioned, some helpful herbs yep. that are great for helping to nourish the thyroid. You know, um, even if you're on thyroid hormone, and a lot of my patients are, sometimes it's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I like to still try to help heal. Support the gland. Yeah, support the actual thyroid gland. Um, and I love nettles, mm -hmm. um, nettle, there's nettle root and nettle leaf. So often nettle leaf is used. Um, coleus mm -hmm. is another herb and often you can find these in um, either a formula that a doctor like ourselves will make for you or um, a combination blend. Mm -hmm. um, there's another herb called Google Google's, yep. and it's not the kind of Google that you think. <laughs> it's a different spelling. <laughs> yeah, it's G-U-G-G-A-L, not <laughs> like Google. Google the corporation. <laughs> I like to use licorice quite a bit too because mm -hmm. there's again often that um, adrenal piece with the thyroid and so that will help keep our cortisol levels up to help thyroid mm -hmm. so yeah, I use licorice quite a bit too. Yeah um, and I think Dr. Angela either already mentioned or you know wanted to mention that um, you know sometimes we need the thyroid hormone. To oh, actually, absolutely! I think this um, is a big talking point because people sometimes feel like it's like bad to take thyroid hormone. Well, I will say this: mm -hmm. um, I will always do what I can naturopathically, and I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe in this medicine mm -hmm. um, to really get the body back into a place where it's in homeostasis and balance Absolutely. and functioning optimally. However, I also say that what naturopathic medicine is, is actually asking the body to heal itself. Mm -hmm. And if for whatever reason, life trauma, stress, sugar, you know, um, genetics, you've used up all or most of your reserves, there's not going to be enough gas in the tank to actually get your body to do everything you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes in those cases, that's when you might need you know, some hormone replacement because yeah, your so body just can't do it on to its own. To make that point, like if we're trying all those things, we're trying the nutrients, you know, everything that should be helping the thyroid gland to make adequate thyroid hormone and it isn't, we do need to replace thyroid hormone. It's not optional to not add back in to get you into a place of healthy thyroid levels because there are consequences. Like we will be sick, like we'll have a bunch of other things happen to our bodies if we're hypothyroid. Um, so just wanting to make sure that whatever means we need to get there, that we do that. And there's lots of options for doing, if we're gonna need thyroid hormone replacement, there are multiple options. Like in our culture, right, it's mostly all T4 replacement, so levothyroxine or Synthroid. So let's rewind okay. a little bit. So um, your <laughs> the brain tells your thyroid yeah. to make thyroid hormone. It releases out T4, which is the inactive form, mm -hmm. and then that gets converted to T3, mm -hmm. which is the active form, and that has a shorter half-life mm -hmm. so what dr. Angela so you use is saying, it quicker it goes away quicker mm -hmm. and so we have both t4 and t3 however sometimes um, well so the synthroid that dr. Angela mentioned is a synthetic form of hormone and it's t4 only but our bodies can have a difficult time converting that t4 into t3 so for some people that may not be 
you know, the ideal route, or they may still not feel great on it, right? Yeah, and I want to say too that it is, you know, the patented form of T4 that's on the market. I think it's still important to say that it's T4, so it is a bioidentical hormone. Sure, sorry, so sorry. You know, just the yes. synthetic clarification, so we know that it is a t its natural form, T4, but it's a pre-patented, you know, kind on the market, and just that it's incomplete. So T4 is one of the hormones we make, but many people do convert T4 just fine and then have adequate levels of T3. So it's not to say that everybody who's put on T4, which is the standard of care, Synthroid or Levothyroxine, is gonna do poorly on it, because it's just not true. I see plenty of patients who have wonderful levels of thyroid hormone, both T4 and T3, from taking Synthroid, but maybe we still need to address the autoimmune piece, and we're gonna do that. But there are many patients who also can't convert the T4 to T3 very well for many reasons. Maybe they're depleted in nutrients, maybe their adrenals are off, and so, um, some people might need something beyond just levothyroxine or Synthroid. Um, you were also saying that tyrosint is... Um, yeah, tyrosint is another form of T4. Right. And some people... I mean, the bottom line is we're all individuals. Yes. And so, you know, one person may need one thing and another person another. And so tyrosint is another um, T4 that... Works cleaner like, base. It's a little bit of a cleaner formula that some people just do better on. The absorption's a little bit better so that maybe the levels are higher, maybe you're able to convert. So again, this is all like, we can tell this through blood testing. And so this is something you go to your doctor, but it's important because again, sometimes just TSH gets checked. Sometimes it's TSH and T4 that gets checked. So making sure that the T3 is also being checked so we can see if we've got enough, if we are converting adequately. So if we're not converting adequately, we have quite a few other options. Mm -hmm. So some of the common ones, there's armor and Synthroid. You like Westroid quite a bit. Nature Throid, you oh, mean. Nature Throid. And yeah. then what's the Nature Throid and? WP Thyroid. You WP said Synthroid. Thyroid. Oh, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. Sorry about that, yeah. Um, so yes, Nature Throid is a T4, yes. T3 combination. With glandular, so that's important too. So that uh, there's a little bit of animal tissue in there. So for people who are vegan, that wouldn't be a choice that they would want, but you could get compounded T4, T3. And then they, the same company that makes Nature Throid also makes a little bit of a cleaner. There's less um, excipients. There's mm -hmm. it's only inulin and one other, I forget, but it's very, very clean and it's WP Thyroid. Okay. Also a T4, T3 combination. Mm -hmm. But up until recently, there was a nationwide shortage of the WP Thyroid. So, so that, no, you know, and Nature it's a little, Thyroid, bit, same thing. little bit tricky there. Um, and as Dr. Man Angela just mentioned, you know, your doctor can work with what's called a compounding pharmacy, mm -hmm. which is kind of like how pharmacies were back in the day, where you can actually work with the pharmacist to create a customized formula. So yeah. you can make a T T4, T3 blend specific to In you. whatever dosing, you know, mm -hmm. you like. And also backing up to conventional things that are available, there's also Cytomel, so that's just T3. So sometimes it'll be, you know, like say for insurance coverage, if you want your medication paid for, you know, Synthroid plus Cytomel, or we can compound, but typically that's something you pay for out of pocket, or there's the combo formulas of the Nature Thread that have a little glandular. So lots of different options that your doctors can help you work with. And this is, I think, just to get the conversation going, that there mm -hmm. are more choices beyond just Synthroid or Levothyroxine, which is the typical standard of care. So... Um, and we'll list these. I know it's confusing, yeah. you know, so, um, but we just want you to have a little bit more education and awareness yeah. and know what to ask for and, you know, advocate for yourselves. Yeah. Um, so this is like, like she said, it's just a bit of a starting point. Yeah. And kind of an intro overview to give you guys mm -hmm. some um, points to think about and percolate on and figure out what makes sense in terms of what to test, what to mm -hmm. um, look at, adjust, how to treat beyond just, you know, Synthroid. So hope you found this video helpful. It was a little medically, a little, <laughs> you know, um, science-y, but full of hopefully some useful information, especially if you are or someone you love is dealing with Hashimoto's mm -hmm. or you were confused about what that was. Yeah. Um, so thank you so much for stopping by. And next week, we're gonna actually talk about the flip side mm -hmm. of autoimmune 
thyroid um, condition, more hyperthyroid. Mm-hmm. Also, um, uh, we're going to talk about Graves. So that's sort of the opposite side of the same coin. So stay yep. tuned for that. And we will see you back here next week. Thanks for being here, everyone. Keep the questions coming. We love hearing what you want to learn about. And we're definitely you know, designing things based on the questions that come in. So keep sharing with us and keep sharing your stories of what's helped you. Mm-hmm. Thanks for being with us. We are loving watching our community grow together. And we will see you back here next week.